the key to Henry's success in getting his hands on the crown of France, or at least much more nearly than any of his predecessors or his successors, was an event that took place on the 10th of September, 1419. The desperate search for a settlement between the Burgundians and the Armagnacs had produced frantic diplomacy in the summer months. Envoys had met in all possible combinations. English and Armagnac, Armagnac and Burgundian, Burgundian and English. But the one that really mattered was the meeting convened in September between the Duke of Burgundy himself and the Armagnac Dauphin. This wasn't the same Dauphin as at Agincourt. Charles VI's sons had an unfortunate habit of dying young. This was his, now his youngest son, Charles, the new Dauphin. And the Duke of Burgundy and the young Dauphin, still in his teens, met at Montereau, where the River Yonne gave into the Seine. And like many diplomatic meetings, this one was arranged for security reasons in the middle of a bridge. Both sides agreed to meet with no more than 10 men each, and the meeting place meant that neither could be ambushed by some hidden army. So that afternoon, the Dauphin and the Duke gathered as arranged. Within a specially constructed wooden enclosure in the middle of the bridge, the Duke knelt at the Dauphin's feet. And then the man standing next to the Dauphin, a former servant of the Duke of Orléans named Tanguy du Châtel, buried an axe deep in the Duke's skull. It was a murder more precisely planned and more ruthlessly executed than the Duke of Burgundy's murder of the Duke of Orléans himself in the streets of Paris 12 years earlier. And it was a murder that irretrievably altered the essence of the conflict, because now there could be no hope, no hope whatsoever, that reconciliation could be brokered between Armagnac and Burgundian. And the direct result of that was a treaty sealed at Troyes in May 1420, by which Henry V's ambitions finally came to fruition. There, in the cathedral, Henry bound himself to marry the French princess Catherine, the daughter of the mad king Charles VI. And in return, the mad king himself, speaking, of course, through the person of his loyal subject, the Duke of Burgundy, the son of the duke whose skull had been stoved in at Montereau, the Mad King disinherited the Dauphin, who'd been responsible for that terrible crime, and recognised instead that Henry V should be the heir to France after the King's death and regent of the kingdom until that time. That's the true story that the gorgeous drama of Shakespeare's Henry V leaves out. The creation of English France, not through his victory at Agincourt, astonishing though it was, but through the bitter and bloody civil war in France, in which the dreadful defeat of Azincourt played a significant part. So that by 1420, the hatred between the two sides within France was so intense that large parts of the kingdom, including the capital Paris, would rather see the English king on the French throne than the so-called Dauphin. And that was a story that would play itself out over the next 30 years, the battle between English France in the north and the kingdom of Bourges in the south, as Armagnac France came to be called. And this wasn't a story with an inevitable ending. So we need to remember, in telling the story of Agincourt, that France could have ended up taking on a very different shape, geographically or politically. 